Cliff, thank you for that introduction. I'll, I'll do my best to live up to it. Um, I have to say, when I started in state and local tax, which is many more years ago than I care to admit, Oregon had about the simplest tax structure that was out there. It, we weren't the lowest tax. You know, we were about in the middle of the range uh, uh, rate-wise, but in terms of just completing the forms and complying with the rules, uh, Oregon was very straightforward and the administrative burden was very, very low. Um, what a difference a couple of dozen of years uh, can make. Um, we now have, uh, I have dealt with all 50 states and I can say with some confidence that the Oregon tax landscape is definitely one of the more complex out there. The Oregon cat is, is fairly unique and the multiple layers, especially now that we have of um, local income taxes just, just makes things that much more complex. I do need to start off with this um, slide that is uh, keeps me out of trouble here. Um, the gist of it is that, that a, a tax answer is going to be extremely dependent on specific facts, and so your results may definitely vary uh, we're talking in general terms here. Um, you want to follow up with your own tax group and your own tax advisor to see how things will specifically apply to your situation. I thought we'd jump right in with the Oregon corporate activity cat tax or the Oregon cat. It's, um, you know, was effective January 1st, 2020. So we've now had three quarters of the cat under our belt. It's called the corporate activity tax, but there's re that's really something of a misnomer because it applies not just to corporations, but really to all business activity that takes place in the state. The general CAT model or CAT template starts with Oregon gross receipts. You su subtract your exempt receipts. There's a subtraction for some subcontractor labor. There is a subtraction for cost of goods sold or labor cost apportioned to Oregon. Uh, there's a million dollar exemption that applies to each filer, multiply by the cat rate of 0 0.0057, add $250 and you're done. So the calculation itself in the realm of state uh, and local taxes is, is pretty trivial, but every line item in that model, other than the million dollar exemption, is pretty complex, it's industry specific, and it's also taxpayer specific. And the skeleton calculation doesn't capture those intricacies. If, and if you've been working through this calculation and trying to drill in on details for the first three quarter estimated tax payments that were due, the most recent one on Halloween, uh, the 31st, you know that that skeleton calculation just does not capture the nuances of each of those items. So it's very important to review your specific fact situation to determine uh, each item and then drop the results into the calculation. I thought we'd go over a couple of the large exemptions um, that really apply in the real estate arena. The CAT statutes have, I believe, 47 different uh, exemptions that apply and some of them are pretty broad. Some of them are things you would never think in your wildest dreams would ever be subject to CAT in the first place. Um, but no mind, there, there's an exemption there. Uh, but one that, that can be very important in the real estate context is the exemption for amounts that are received as agent. Um, I don't know how many of you report in Washington and are familiar with the reimbursement and agency rules in Washington, but Washington has issued very, very detailed rules on what amounts can be exempted and what, and what amounts aren't. The Oregon rules are, are much more vague and I think broader in scope and potentially more helpful to taxpayers. Uh, an agent is a person who is acting on behalf of another and subject to that person's control. And um, Oregon recognizes that all facts and circumstances must be considered in determining if a person is acting as an agent with respect to a specific transaction. 
The Oregon rule, uh, which is published, um, if you do a Google search for OAR 150-317-1100, it should pop right up for you. And the most recent and final version of the rule has some very helpful examples, I think, um, including detailed examples for contractors, which one of our Moss Adams um, uh, senior managers, who's, who's since made partner, uh, was instrumental in getting into that rule. Uh, so if, under a fixed price contract where the contractor bears all the risk, uh, the contractor is not an agent. So the contractor says they're going to build a structure for a certain price. The contractor's at full risk of uh, making, an, making income or incurring a loss with respect to that contract. The contractor is not an agent. For a cost reimbursable contract, when the contractor is acting on behalf of and under the direction and control of its principal, um, in use of subcontractors, then the amounts the contractor received from the principal in order to pay the subcontractors will qualify most likely for that agent exemption, assuming that the documentation all lines up. So those are so two kind of clear bright line examples, one where there's no agency exemption and one when there is an agency exemption. But a lot of uh, arrangements kind of fall along a gray scale there. Uh, maybe having some factors that are like an agent and some factors are not. So it's going to be very important to review each individual contract. You know, the, the conclusion can be different for each contract and even for each type of transaction under the contract. It's not an all or nothing test. It's a facts and circumstances with respect to a payment that's been received. Uh, another area that would be important in real estate is property management, for, for example. A property manager will receive the rents on behalf of the property owner, um, pay expenses, take a fee, and then remit the rest. And so it will be very important to document the agency relationship there in order to uh, qualify for that exclusion and defend any kind of audit assessment. An issue, uh, not a, exactly an exemption, but a very important issue, I think, in the real, real property um, industry is the definition of a unitary group. So a unitary group is um, a group of legal entities that are treated as one taxpayer. So for income tax purposes, you might have four different partnerships and a couple of S corps and maybe even a C corporation as well. Each one of those entities will file its own Oregon reports. Uh, a C corp will pay tax. Flow through entities will file Oregon reports and issue Oregon K-1s to the members or owners. Um, but for CAT, a unitary group can include uh, a group, um, all kinds of legal entities. So a unitary group can include partnerships, S corporations, C corporations, even a sole proprietor maybe. The defining characteristic of a unitary group is that there has to be more than 50% common ownership of the entities that would comprise the group. Uh, and that ownership can be either direct or indirect. And they have to operate uh, as a unitary business. So, you know, an, a partnership that's strictly investment, you know, might not be unitary with another partnership that's actually operating. It's very much a facts and circumstances test. A huge um, gray area or actually open area here that we're waiting for clarification from the Department of Revenue is what exactly is common ownership? Uh, and two situations that frequently pop up are individual family members in the same um, same direct family, are they treated as common owners? So would their ownership be aggregated for purposes of this 50% test? So if you have you know, two parents and two children that each have the same percent ownership in several different partnerships, but no one has 50%, will those be aggregated and deemed to be under common ownership. That, that's a, a big open area that the Department of Revenue hasn't provided clarity on yet. Uh, another open area kind of somewhat related would be 
if you have three individuals, whether or not they're related, let's say they're unrelated, three individuals that each own one third of two different partnerships that would operate, you know, in a common business, uh, would that um, classify, would that be classified as common control so that those two entities would file one cat return? Um, they'd still file, each one would still file an Oregon income tax report and each one would still issue its own K-1s. But for cap purposes, there's a possibility that that would be one entity rather than two. Um, so a practical implication there, uh, of course, two practical implications. The first one is just administrative. Um, how do you know which entity should file? Um, if you're a unitary group, the benefit is, is that if there are inner entity or inner company transactions, those are eliminated for CAT. Anyone who operates in Washington and has to file B&O knows that even when you have disregarded entities, so single member LLCs, for example, that are owned by one uh, individual or one entity, those are disregarded for federal purposes and most state purposes, but Washington respects a legal entity just to the point of pain and would tax each one. Um, for CAT, if the unitary tests are met, anything intercompany is eliminated. The flip side of that is that the unitary group just gets one $1 million exemption, whereas separate filers each get that million dollar exemption, which is worth, you know, it's worth $5,700 per exemption. So that, you know, that can add up. So that are sort of a quick cat update. I know that, you know, since most of us have been dealing with it for the vast majority of 2020 now, I thought I'd just hit some of the high points on, on things that have been clarified and things that have been changed. And um, we'll move on to some recent developments on other Oregon state and local taxes. Real fast, um, I had a question that I thought was really good. It's, um, um, basically, did we expect um, Oregon to follow suit that like Washington has with the transfer um, tax? Uh, that's an excellent question. I don't know. Um, so Washington County right now is the only county that has a transfer tax. Um, is And I believe that there was a measure before the legislature that would ban any other county for implementing a transfer tax. Cliff, does that sound right? Cliff and Abby? But that did not pass? Did not pass, but I believe there's another city in Oregon that charges a transfer tax. I can't tell you what it is, that, but I yeah, believe yeah. there is a city that charges mm -hmm. a transfer tax. And I think that, yes, that uh, there will be tra more transfer taxes in Oregon. And the transfer tax that question was asking about is as you gain in price of property in Washington, transfer taxes can be as high as three percent mm -hmm. so um that is what i think that question is driving at do we have that kind of system yet in oregon and the answer is not that i'm aware of but could okay. happen yeah. anything can happen okay. anymore it's for a game yeah another point uh speaking of washington transfer taxes is the washington transfer tax uh, applies not just to the outright sale or transfer of property itself but to the transfer of an interest in an entity that owns real property, the transfer tax can attach if the ownership of the if the owner of the interest transfers more than fifty percent over thirty six months. Now, uh, Washington, the Washington County transfer tax is not structured that way. Um, right is that now, like a state tax? Is that like an estate tax, Jennifer? Uh, I don't know that I. I'm not an estate tax person. Um, so I can't really opine on what estate taxes look like, but um, the Washington tax, just the, the real estate transfer tax, Washington and California have the same mechanism where let's say you have a partnership that owns um, real estate. If 50% of that partnership changes hands, then the transfer tax is due. Uh, now, whether that applies in an estate context, I know there are rules specific to that, but I don't know what they are. Um, I would have to uh, ask one of my colleagues that. 
Uh, so, so in Oregon kind of state and local overview, I, I put this chart together and I, I realized that it's, it's difficult to read, but you know, I, th I think that the difficulty in reading it is really a result in my view of sort of the complex multi-level the sheer number of taxes that Oregon at the state level and local level uh, has right now. So we can break them down though in taxes on business and taxes on individual individuals. Looking at taxes on business, these are all top marginal rates, by the way. So, um, you know, lower rates apply uh, for many of these taxes at, at lower, lower income levels, but I've put in the top bracket rates. So the Oregon income tax on C corporations is at 7.6%. The corporate activity tax that's on not just corporations, but all businesses is a modified gross receipts tax. The Paid Family Medical Leave Act is kicking in January 1, 2022. And that often does not show up on lists of Oregon taxes because when you look at the activating statute, it is classified as a contribution rather than a tax um, because it's a, it's a contribution to a fund to pay benefits under the Family Medical Leave Act. Uh, so it's, it's often termed as a contribution and you might see more of it, might see it referred to more in that way. That is a, a based on payroll. It's a little unusual. It's split. Uh, it's a 1% total tax. The employer pays 40% of it and the employee pays 60%. So that's a 0.4% a tax on the business. Local taxes, the Portland business license tax, uh, that's 2.6% now. Um, that's, you know, that rate has crept up significantly over the past few years. Multnomah County business income tax, the McBit, that is at 2.0% effective January 1, 2020. And then we have the uh, new metro area tax, the supportive housing services tax. That's, that's often referred to as the homeless tax. That was passed in May, 2020. It's effective January 1, 21. That's a 1% income tax on entity profits if the business has at least 5 million in total receipts. And if we hearken back a slide or two to the Oregon cat, we talked about a unitary group for the Oregon cat and how that's kind of a unique concept in that it can incorporate all kinds of different entities. The Portland, the supportive services, housing services tax doesn't have that mechanism. So to the best of my reading, we don't have the full code section for this yet, but what I read on the ordinance and the materials that I see, they're going to follow the Portland and Multnomah County rules to the extent that they can, so it'll be at the entity level. What that means is that each entity gets kind of this five million in total receipts um, threshold. So if the entity doesn't have five million in total receipts, it's not subject to this 1% entity level tax. Uh, then, of course, we have the TriMet payroll tax that's um, a little over three quarters of a percent of payroll and the, pay, the Portland rental tax at $60 per door. And I don't believe that, you know, that would be something that I think that was not passed by the voters. So the city council could increase that, uh, I believe, just by a majority vote of the city council. Taxes on individuals, this is another breakout of that opening slide. We have our individual income tax at 9.9% at the state level, the statewide transit tax, and then starting 1-1-22, the Paid Family Medical Leave Act contribution, 0.6% of payroll. At the local level, we have two new taxes. We, we haven't really had local individual income taxes for a while, but, but we've got two big ones now. Um, starting in a few weeks here. There's the supportive housing services tax that's uh, effective January 1. That's a 1% income tax on, on all Oregon income of metro area residents and the metro sourced income of non-residents. It applies to income over 125,000 for a single filer, 200,000 for married filing joint. I did not have time to update this slide. Um, Metro has stated it doesn't, you know, as the ordinance is written, 
a partnership, for instance, would pay the tax, and then the members of that partnership would pay tax on their distributive shares. So um, I Metro had a, a working session today um, at about 2.30, 2.45, they posted their intent that they will have, you know, and it, they won't double tax this income. So if you're an individual and you are a member of a partnership or owner of an S corp that's subject to this tax, that the ta the income subject to that tax will be subtracted from your individual income before you pay it. So there won't be double taxation on that. And they estimate that's going to cut their total collections by 10 to 15 percent, you know, significant amount. Then we have the Multnomah County Preschool for All Tax that passed um, a couple weeks ago now, uh, also effective 1121. So this is another tax with a pretty short fuse on it. This is one and a half percent on income over 125,000 or 200,000 joint, 3% uh, over 250, 400,000. Kind of a key point here that didn't get a whole lot of play is that baked into this ordinance is after five years, those rates increase to 2.3% and 3.8%. And you know, at the one one and a half percent bracket level, that's over a, that's over a 50% increase uh, in that tax rate. Um, and then the 3.8, the 3.0 goes to 3.8 as well. Um, and so that that's baked in right now. Um, the ordinance also, both of these ordinances allow the governing bodies to increase the tax rates if the collections are not um, meeting the budgeted needs. A big open area here is both of these taxes, uh, the Portland, the, the um, Supportive Housing Services and the Preschool for All tax, they both apply to income of non-residents that's derived from or received from sources within the jurisdiction. We do not yet have a definition of what that is. Uh, if anyone remembers the old Multnomah County I tax that mentioned earlier um, in the early aughts, it applied, it, was, it had a simpler mechanism. It applied to residents of the county, and if you were uh, a part year resident of the county, you basically prorated your tax based on your residency period. If you were a non-resident, you didn't pay it. Um, both the supportive housing services and the preschool taxes don't seem to have that simple um, mechanism, and they appear, at least the ordinance would allow them to reach out and tax income from sources within the jurisdiction. The, the issue here is that we don't know what that means yet. Um, they've said that they will follow the uh, Portland and McBitt sourcing rules. What that means exactly uh, in an individual, um, like wage earner context, we don't know. Still waiting for rules, and, and that's a very important point. So what does all this mean? If we kind of pull it together, um, Cliff gave me a hypothetical here where a piece of, of property is sold, the owner receives $4 million and there's $2 million of gain. So basis, however that basis is determined, the basis is $2 million, um, $4 million of proceeds. So, and if we assume that the property is held by a pass-through entity that's owned by in-county residents, and, and we look at, at you know, three different counties, Multnomah, Washington, and Deschutes for what the tax would be. You know, all, no matter where you live in Oregon, you're going to pay Oregon CAT and you're going to pay personal income tax. So assuming that this property does not fall into a fairly broad exception, which is property described in IRC 1221 or 1231. So I should have put that on this slide, but that's a, a key point. So assuming that it does not fall within that fairly broad exception, you know, we've got some real differences in the taxation. You know, they're, everybody's subject to CAT. Everybody's subject to personal income. Um, at the county and city level, though, we have some very different results. Washington County currently has a transfer tax of 1%. Uh, the Metro Supportive Housing Services tax, that will be 1% of the gain. Um, this is assuming that, I'm assuming that this entity does have at least $5 million in receipts. 
if if all it had were four million dollars of receipts and that was the only activity at all uh, the metro tax might not apply to the entity but it would apply to individuals so it's probably the same six of one half a dozen of the other um, that's 20,000 in Multnomah and Washington counties, zero in the Deschutes. Uh, the preschool tax applies to Multnomah County individual residents only. So even if you live in the Portland metro area, if you're not in Multnomah County, you won't pay this tax. And then uh, similar to the Multnomah County business income tax, another 2%. And then we've got this Portland business license tax at another 2.6%. So there are some fairly stark differences based on where the property is located close to $400,000 in Portland Multnomah, and then it drops pretty quickly down to $220,000 in Deschutes. This is assuming that Bend isn't the city with that transfer tax. <laughs> so, pardon me. Do we have questions to this point? Yeah, I just received one. Um... So these taxes apply to sales as well as annual income and someone's never moving back to PDX ever. Well, so the, the CAT applies to um, modified receipts because if you start with receipts, you get a subtraction for your cost, you know, for some costs in the real estate business, that's going to be fairly low. Um, and you also get that million dollar exemption, that million dollar you know, first, first giveaway, first give me, and then the CAD is applied to that. So it's modified gross receipts. The Washington County transfer tax is applied to proceeds. The other taxes are all on net income and not proceeds. So another question was what if you sell in PDX area, but live outside the area? Well, that's where things get really complicated. What is, what is income derived from sources within the county. We have not had to deal with that yet. So, you know, the, Port, the uh, Portland tax applies only at the, the um, Portland Business License and Multnomah and McBeth, they apply at the entity level. The old Multnomah County I tax applied to residents or part year residents only. Uh, what we have here is we don't have a definition yet of income from sources derived within. You know, it's, it's possible that they will issue a rule that says entities have to issue K-1s. You know, it's, it's, it's really hard to say. Um, we do have that break on double taxation. So, you know, if all you own is, you know, an interest in an entity that does business only on Multnomah County and it pays that Multnomah ca County tax, you, you won't have you know, you won't have another local tax on that piece of income. Um, for the uh, homeless services tax, for the Multnomah County tax, it, it, it gets more complicated. Will Multnomah County require that the entity issue K-1s? Um, you know, we, we don't know. We're waiting for rules on that. So I think that, you know, I probably should have, I could have um, started this whole section with you know, more questions than answers at this point, because um, that, that is sort of where we are. Uh, you know, so some considerations here that we, that we do know you'll need to, to look at are, you know, review your determinations of how Portland and Multnomah County source income. When it's income for a professional service that's provided, uh, there are some specific rules that are very different from how Oregon sources income for the income tax and even receipts for purposes of the CAT. So review those rules. They're in what's called a VTAR, a Business Tax Administrative Rule, and they are posted on the uh, Portland City website. Uh, if any work locations like work from home arrangements have changed due to the pandemic, whereas if you had an, an office in Portland and everybody had to scatter mid-March, you know, your, your answer could be very different for how you source receipts for um, January through March 15th, from March 15th through December 31st. And so look at your details and make sure that you're not over-reporting your Portland area receipts. 
this is a little less important in the real in the property management context. If you deliver property, uh, you know, look at how you do that and, and make sure you line that up with the Portland Multnomah County rules. These are all existing considerations, by the way, but they're kind of put on steroids with the um, metro tax and you know with the new supportive housing services and preschool taxes. You know now we have an additional four percent um, potential rate, so it just put it on steroids, so to speak, or or just really amped up the um, impact of these considerations. Um, the fourth bullet point, I also did not have time to update this, first went to the Metro conversation earlier, uh, that, was, that was this afternoon. Um, but they're considering right now, and this is the supportive housing services right now, it doesn't apply to the preschool tax, but they're considering requiring an entity to withhold for employees if the employee requests it. So if the employee requests withholding on supportive services taxes, the entity would be required to withhold, but there's no blanket withholding requirement. Uh, the fifth bullet, no, bullet point though, I think that this is going to be the case. Don't have rules on it yet, don't have the law, but businesses will most likely be required to make estimated payments for their portion of the supportive housing services tax. Kind of final bullet here, metro district boundaries are not the same as the county boundaries. So you may be, have a, a you know, property or have a location that's well within the county boundary, especially for Clackamas County though, uh, large parts of it are not in the metro boundary. So check your addresses. And the uh, metro website, I believe, has an interactive tool that will allow you to you know, put in an address and it will tell you what district you're in. So that can be helpful. Jennifer, we have a couple more questions before we move on. Uh, first one, um, and this kind of ties into an earlier one, um, what if we receive income from clients in the PDX area but we live outside the area? So take a look at those BTARs that apply to your specific type of business because, you know, the sourcing rule for Oregon, so let's say you live in Washington, but you have a lot of income from Oregon clients you're going to have an Oregon income tax return most likely, you know, and again, your, your specific fact pattern may vary if I can sort of refer back to that opening legal slide. Um, and those receipts would most likely be considered Oregon commercial activity. They aren't necessarily Portland or Multnomah County activity. So, and so, um, you know, there, there are several rules that apply to several different types of business. Uh, talk with your tax professional about which rule applies to you and, you know, really drill in on it and, and see what your Portland Multnomah County Metro source is going to be. Metro has said that they intend to piggyback off of those rules. Uh, so, you know, you, at this point, our best information is that look at those rules and just instead of Portland or Multnomah County, just substitute Metro. And then uh, one gentleman um, had two questions. Are you exempt from other taxes if you have a 1031 exchange? And the other one, are funds received from an insurance loss considered income? Oh boy. Uh, so on the insurance loss, so the, um, let's look at the, the CAT for insurance loss. Um, the CAT, like I said, they have 47 different exemptions. Um, several of them do refer to proceeds that are received uh, under insurance. If it's like a replacement of business income, then that would be subject to CAT. Uh, if it is um, not a replacement of income, if it's something else like a, a slip and fall or something type proceeds, it most likely would not be. So look at you know those 47 exemptions and see if, if one applies there. Then uh, for income tax, for the local taxes, they're going to start with, or with your taxable income for Oregon purposes or federal purposes. So if it's included in Oregon net income, then it would be included in your income base for the local taxes. 
Uh, for a 1031 exchange, um, it's my understanding that that they follow federal for timing, but the sourcing is is somewhat tainted. And so when there is an ultimate destination, then you could have uh, an Oregon tax impact. And because you start with Oregon for the local, then there could be a local tax impact of that as well. So uh, we do have um, some real uncertainties here. Like I said, I, uh, I'm afraid I'm in a position where we uh, all have more questions and answers here. So a Washington resident who's a W-2 of a Portland company be subject to these new taxes. And then we have the additional wrinkle of, uh, you know, in January, February, maybe they were working in Portland proper, but even if the company stays in Portland, they're working in Washington. Um, well, an individual who receives a distributive share of partnership income taxed by Portland Multnomah County also pay the new Metro and Multnomah County taxes. So for Metro, we've, we've got an answer there. The piece that's already been taxed uh, at the Metro for the supportive housing services tax will not be passed at the, will not be taxed at the individual level. But um, to the best of my understanding right now, the Portland, business license tax, the Multnomah County business income tax, the supportive services tax are three separate taxes. So each one of them would apply to a partnership that does business in the jurisdiction. Um, an individual moving out of the state during 2021, how will that individual be taxed? We don't have rules on that yet. Um, hopefully that is coming since the tax is effective uh, you know, really, we're kind of in a matter of days now. And employees who perform services outside the county in the metro district, uh, how do we track and document that? Again, we, you know, we're waiting. We, we don't have guidance. We're, we're waiting for guidance there. So um, just real quickly to wrap up here, I'm afraid I'm stepping on some of um, um, Chris's time, which I don't intend, to, didn't intend to do. For Washington, uh, Washington has local BNO as well as state level. The uh, local jurisdictions implemented market sourcing effective January 1, 2020. So there can be, you know, very different uh, tax results now in Washington. Um, receipts from services performed for Washington customers. Big changes in the real estate excise tax structure for Washington is. As Cliff mentioned earlier, those rates have gone up, you know, and they're, they're pretty high now. Uh, when you add the state and the local rates together, they can approach a decently high rate. There are new rules on the controlling interest sales. Uh, there are increased disclosure and also a much longer period during which a, um, during which a, a, an, owner, an applicable ownership transfer can apply. And with that, I know that we answered some questions along the way, and I think we'll have time at the end, but I'd like to turn it over to Chris. All right. Okay, let me introduce Chris real quickly. Um, and that is uh, right here. Chris. Chris Robinson is senior counsel, longtime member of the state bar since 1977, has fully represented clients in all types of complex property tax situations. He's an expert in property tax throughout Oregon. He's an accomplished litigator representing clients before the Oregon Tax Court and the Oregon Supreme Court. He's an active speaker, published author of legal articles. Um, he has been active in property tax legislation helping to pass laws to protect taxpayer rights and provide clarity on complex property tax valuation issues. He's a member of the legislative work group that wrote the special assessment legislation for affordable housing enacted in 2001. And he holds a doctorate in jurisprudence from Lewis and Clark Law School. He's a member of the Corporate Council uh, Real Estate Ta Land Use and Taxation section of the Oregon State Bar as well as the uh, Institute of Property Taxation, NAOP, Oregon Business and Industry, IRAM and other, and the Appraisal Institute. 
Chris and I have worked together for over 20 years on different kinds of tax appeals, um, often uh, not having a lot of success, but he has had a lot of su success finding customers who really have had uh, a, a need and are able to um, save some money uh, with his process of appealing. Um, we have a little outline that uh, I believe Abby is going to put up here. I'm is sure. That correct. Okay. And um, what I see on mine is employee self service paycom. Let me see again. Okay. Let's try it again. And there's a share screen. Same thing again. This is employee self service paycom online. And somebody is on off of mute. Can you mute yourself, please? Can you mute everybody real quickly? Nothing is showing up at this moment yet for Chris. I know you're, she's throwing her hands up in the air. Technical difficulties. I'm sharing my screen. Um, we I see your screen, and what we see on your screen is a blue screen, not of death, but uh, I think if you share your screen and find his outline, ah, this looks, there you go. Beautiful. You just did it. Bravo, bravo. <laughs> okay, so um, Chris is going to be talking about appeal deadlines, evaluation, and you can read this. I don't have to read it all. Um, and there'll be some red flags. So Chris is gonna go through these notes here. And Chris, are you up and about and ready to roll? Are you unmuted? Chris, are you unmuted? Hello, Chris Robinson, are you out there? I know you're there somewhere. I've unmuted him. Okay. Can you hear me? We can now. And yeah. welcome. Hey, uh, my beautiful mug is not up on the screen, but that's okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk. Uh, got a few things to cover. It's a very strange environment right now for uh, property taxation and property valuation because of the pandemic. Um, and that has put a stress on a number of uh, property types. I think first of all, just some very basic things. The appeal deadline for the 2020 tax year is December 31st. Uh, a little bit about our background, our firm, um, our practice is solely devoted to property tax valuation, litigation, uh, and consulting. And like Cliff said, uh, been in practice since 1977 and uh, uh, have the pleasure of practicing with uh, our oldest son, Alex, uh, who's uh, been here for now five years. Our valuation date is always January 1st, and we have received many calls from people saying, uh, I want to appeal my assessment because of the pandemic. I've lost income. Uh, I've lost tenants. I want to appeal. And it's Unfortunately, I have to tell them and explain to them that with the valuation date being January 1st, the pandemic had not landed here. There was no government ordered shutdown. Um, and so it, it really is an unfortunate situation. There was a period of time where we did have what was called a board of ratio review. That went away with the passage of Measure 50 in 1996. But that allowed taxpayers to appeal uh, declines in value during the tax year. That would have been the perfect remedy uh, for 2020 because you very, uh, the tax year runs from July 1st to June 30th. By June 30th of 2020, um, and during the tax year, the, uh, uh, the 2020 tax year, we definitely knew. Uh, we had the government shut down. We had restaurants closing, businesses closing. So uh, unfortunately, that uh, process is not available anymore. 
So when can we rely upon the impact of the pandemic? Well, 2021 or J January 1, 2021, the impact of the pandemic is fully in play. And so we do um, anticipate that there will be a high volume of property tax appeals next year for all property types. Obviously, the, the property types have been different property types have been affected differently. Retail has really taken the brunt of the pandemic uh, with the restaurants, bowling alleys, theaters, any, any kind of establishment that requires gatherings to be successful um, are really, really, it's really taken a toll. And just in the Portland Business Journal last week, there is a feature article about all the businesses that have closed permanently. And uh, just this morning, Macy's announced they were closing their uh, Lloyd Center store permanently. So it's been hurtful. 2021 is going to be the year, uh, the year to put that in front of the assessor. How will we measure the declines in value? Well, Obvious, one obvious, if it's a, a reason would be if it's an income property, uh, the decline in net operating income or uh, de decline in occupancy. You know, uh, some of these buildings are uh, completely vacant or substantially vacant. Office buildings, we, the jury is still out. Um, what I hear is uh, even though people are working from home, the rent is continuing to be paid in most cases. Um, however, I think some companies are rethinking their footprint and uh, time will tell uh, whether, uh, you know, they go back uh, to the, and occupy the same amount of space that they had previously. There is currently a lot of office subly uh, sublet space out there in the market, well over a million square feet. So what impact does that have? Well, new space has to compete with that sublet space, and many times that sublet space is offered at an attractive rent to uh, reduce the red ink from the original tenant who's paying, paying full rent um, and no longer occupies the space. So getting someone in there even at a lesser rent, uh, helps mitigate the uh, mitigate mitigate the red red ink. Industrials held up very well, and in fact, is prospering um, because of the, the supply chain role that it uh, fulfills um, is is doing very well, and we're continuing to see new new development. Uh, multifamily, which I think many of the Bluestone and Hockley uh, clients have uh, or are involved with those kinds of properties, again, caught in that vice of the pandemic wasn't here January 1 of 2020. They've had rent forbearance. They've had uh, uh, no evictions, a ban on evictions. Uh, so especially for the smaller uh, uh, mom and pop uh, ownerships makes it very difficult because uh, there's still debt service, there's still insurance, there's still all the expenses to pay, and yet um, they are restricted in terms of what they can do uh, as far as collection of rent and uh, evictions for non-payment rent. One of the things that we have not seen yet are sales of any property type that definitely demonstrate that we're in a new paradigm, new, new valuation uh, situation uh, that would definitely show a decline in value. Uh, we'll see, um, you know, as time progresses, whether we will see some of those sales that provide new benchmarks uh, of, of value. The statute are real market value statute, which is ORS 308205, does provide that a government restriction on use of the property must be considered in valuation. 
So that's, again, uh, a primary thing to rely on in 2021 is I was ordered to shut down. Uh, uh, I can't serve. My restaurant is closed. I can't serve anybody. I've been definitely impacted. And the same thing in the multifamily uh, situation where there have been uh, the forbearance of rent and uh, no evictions or restriction on evictions. So how do we proceed forward uh, for 2020 and reviewing properties to see if there is an appeal opportunity? Well, there's some, uh, what I've captioned here as red flags. New construction. If you had a property that was completed in 2019, it was valued then as complete in 2020. It's imperative that those values, the market value be reviewed because the market value in this case for new construction permanently sets the assessed value, which will is subject to that 3% increase um, sub for subsequent years. Chronic or extensive vacancy. We actually had a Supreme Court decision. We won at the tax court. It involved a neighborhood shopping center that lost an anchor. Uh, that anchor space uh, sat vacant for three plus years. Um, it increased the vacancy and collection of rent in the inline spaces, uh, triggering co tenancy agreements. And so some of the inline te uh, tenants were all they were paying were their share of expenses with no rent. Uh, the issue was, well, do we recognize the impact of that vacant space in the market value of the property for property tax purposes? Multnomah County said, uh, no, these things happen. Uh, the grocery store had been there for 20 years, and so the fact that uh, it's now vacant for three years is just something that happens. Um, we, uh, of course, disagreed, and that market behavior, a prudent buyer would not pay the value for that shopping center based on a stabilized income stream that did not exist. We won at the tax court, and we were affirmed by the Oregon uh, Supreme Court. The name of that case is Powell Street. Um, so it's an important case to remember in light of where we are now with many buildings with extensive vacancy and um, when you have that vacancy, the way we approached that valuation issue was we valued the property as stabilized, but then backed off the cost to get there. And that cost would include rent loss, uh, leasing commissions, tenant improvements, and lost expense reimbursement if we're dealing with a triple net property. And in that case, it, it amounted to uh, several million dollars. Uh, and so we got the reduction uh, in that case, it was sort of needed. Properties with significant capital needs. So if you have an apartment project and you discuss or discover that uh, the decks are rotten or stairs, uh, you have serious water penetration issues, uh, that can be a basis for appeal, um, not only of the current year, but in certain cases, you can go back retroactively two years and uh, get adjustments as well. Uh, if you can prove that those conditions existed in those prior years. Uh, properties that would benefit from compression, and I'll explain, try to make, explain it as simply as possible. Compression occurs when there's two tax rates. You have a measure five tax rate and you have a measure 50 tax rate. The measure five tax rate is based upon market value. The measure 50 tax rate is based on assessed value. You're supposed to be taxed on the lower of those two calculations. So when we uh, have a situation that we do uh, during a recession um, or when a property is being challenged operationally, we have done many appeals where we reduce the market value, not below the assessed value, but we reduced it low enough that the county had to recalculate the tax based on the lower measure five tax rate. And if you've been around for a long time, the measure five tax rate was a tax rate limitation measure. Back in 1990, the tax rate in downtown Portland and most of Multnomah County 
was $30 per thousand of real market value. It was amazing. It was very expensive. That when Measure 5 passed, it ratcheted over time, it ratcheted down that tax rate to $15, $5 for schools and $10 for general government. So when you're looking at your tax statement on your income properties, one very simple formula to determine is it is it possible to, to have a compression refund or compression appeal is take your education tax and divide it by 0 0.005. That will tell you the market value you need to be below uh, in order to trigger a reduction on the education tax. On the government tax, divide that government tax by 0 0.01 and that will tell you the market value you need to be below in order to trigger compression uh, or savings on the general government tax. Bonds are not affected. Bonds are outside uh, Measure 50 uh, uh, parameters. A purchase or sale of the property that could trigger compression. So obviously if there is a sale of the property, and especially in this market, there might be some attractive deals out there. Uh, one should check to see if that's a triggering event for providing an opportunity for appeal. As far as the recent ballot measures, uh, there were three. Jennifer talked about the uh, one, the free preschool, but that is an income tax. On the property tax side, we had two measures. Uh, one was the library measure. Um, according to the information that was on the website on that measure, that will add 80 cents per thousand of assessed value uh, for that measure. And then parks, um, that will add uh, 61 cents uh, per thousand of assessed value. So we're definitely going to see an increase in tax rates, uh, but I don't think those will be fully implemented until 2022. Um, possible taxation reform. I am a co-chair of a, of a subcommittee on the uh, Oregon State Bar uh, Taxation Section. So uh, one of my charges um, in that group is to monitor legislation and uh, DOR, uh, Department of Revenue Rulemaking. And uh, we do anticipate in this next session, 2021 uh, regular session, that there may be some ele uh, legislative initiatives that come forth. Uh, one that's been talked about is to take Measure 50 out of the Constitution so that the legislature can tinker with it. Um, others that have been discussed were uh, uh, amending Measure 50 to create a split role with uh, commercial uh, properties being taxed at market value or assessed at market value and uh, residential properties staying in the Measure 50 uh, program. Uh, if that were to happen, what we were told by the organizations that were supporting that measure was that it would be revenue neutral. Um, I'm somewhat suspect of that. Um, they did say that they, in order to be revenue neutral, they would have to significantly reduce the tax rates. Otherwise, you would really have more or less a, uh, a windfall in uh, tax revenue. So kind of wrapping it up, um, encourage people, and, and uh, Bluestone and Hockley has been great in terms of, you know, sending over properties to review when um, they think there might be a question or an opportunity for appeal. And, uh, and we do work uh, with a lot of property management companies, uh, small and large clients. We have pension funds, national clients, and we also represent a lot of local investors and local developers. Um, one additional thing that I didn't have in my outline, I was talking about new construction, and I can't remember if I mentioned the new construction exemption. That is so important um, because it exempts the tax on the improvements while it's under construction. And uh, the deadline to file that application is April 1st. And unfortunately, there's no late filing provision if you miss the deadline. 
you're kind of sunk. So with that, if there's any questions, I'd be glad to address them. Maybe give them a couple of um, seconds to put something into the chat. Okay. People have to type. Yep. <laughs> <clears throat> well, while we're waiting, did something show up? While we're waiting, first of all, thank you, Chris and Jen. Um, so, if remember that uh, if you were to sell a property, you have to deal with whatever income you're making that year, both. Um, uh, not just uh, you know under income taxes. So if you're if you're thinking about selling something, your your income goes up significantly unless you do a 1031 exchange. So um, you need to consider how you want to place or replace properties as you're uh, fighting through the whole challenges of these additional ta taxes that are that are now in place. Um, Cliff, there is one thing I wanted to add. Um, Go ahead, Chris. While I, while I said, you know, 2021 is really the year to um, bring the pandemic and the impact of the pandemic into play, uh, we have also advised clients if they have a reasonable basis, if they have a credible basis for an appeal of the 2020 assessment, certainly we can bring the 2021 year into the discussion. And um, so I, I wanted to make sure, you know, that is an option out there. And uh, you don't need to wait until, even if you don't file an appeal in 2020, you don't need to wait until next October when you get your tax statement to have a conversation or, uh, you know, engage a consultant to uh, start that conversation with the assessor. Uh, you know, we're looking at uh, as early as after the first of the year on certain properties to have that have that conversation, regardless of whether a 2020 appeal was filed or not. Okay, that's good. I do have a couple of questions. Um, so the first one is, what percent of appeals are successful, approximately? What percentage of appeals Correct. are successful? Uh, it's a high percentage. You know, I should keep stats, but I almost think that's kind of bad luck. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, but it is a very high percentage. And, um, you know, I... Remember, like remember, let me interrupt for a second. Remember, Chris pre-screens everything he appeals on. So he will not automatically try to throw something against the wall that he isn't, doesn't think is going to be successful. His time is too valuable. So go ahead, Chris. Well, right, right. We do uh, almost all of our appeals on a contingency fee basis. So it really is a nothing ventured, nothing gained uh, proposition. And so we get earn a fee if we're successful. And if we get a donut, we don't earn a, a fee. But you're right, uh, Cliff is right. We do screen uh, our, uh, you know, I have a screening process so that when we do file an appeal, we feel that we've got a reasonable chance of being successful. And we'd like to think that our advocacy is, is uh, also contributes to, uh, to these results. We've been to the Supreme Court, Oregon Supreme Court three times, and we have a perfect record. Uh, and, uh, and so I think what, what the counties know and the Department of Revenue know is that if we've got a good case, we're not gonna go away. And at some point, they might as well have to deal with us, so. What's the next question? Any chance on abatements, if a percentage of all units, it says our LIH, which I'm assuming is low income low housing, 60% housing. Mm -hmm. AM, inclusionary zoning, for example. Well, those are two different programs. You know, inclusionary zoning, if you elect that program, you have an abatement uh, uh, on the residential portion of the project. If you have retail space, it is not exempt. 
Um, but there is a separate program, a, a special assessment program for affordable housing that uh, I was involved in getting passed. And that was back, I think, in 2001. And uh, prior to the, all the litigation, one of our Supreme Court cases involved the valuation of affordable housing. And uh, up until the time that we succeeded in our litigation, affordable housing was being valued the same as market rate housing. So they were ignoring, the counties were ignoring the fact that you had restricted rents, higher operating expenses, and um, as a result, those properties suffered. And so we litigated for the better part of 10 years uh, and, and finally, uh, finally resolved it. And so now, even under real market value, they must consider the fact of the restricted rents and other restrictions on the use of the property and then there is a special assessment program which you elect by application that also is available. Two very, very um, important programs. I think that probably goes into <clears throat> the final question we received, which is if you do win an appeal, will it take effect the following year or would it be retroactive to the beginning of the pandemic? Could you say that again? I was having trouble hearing you. Uh, if you do win an appeal, Will it yeah. take effect the following year, or would it be retroactive to the beginning of the pandemic? Well, um, as far as the subsequent years, there's a statute um, that uh, allows a carry forward of the adjudication for the five subsequent tax years, except for trending um, and any other changes to the property, like new additions to the property. Um, as far as retroactive, um, there is a retroactive pro pro process for single family or one to four unit uh, properties that if you improve uh, a 20% or greater error in this case, 2018 and 2019 assessments, you can appeal those uh, years retroactively. So let's say you filed an appeal for 2020, you got a 30% reduction in value and you looked at those prior year assessments, you'd say, well, you know, it, the value wasn't any different. Uh, I want to appeal those prior years. And we've done that for a number of clients. Normally, you know, it's in a fairly, um, you know, high end uh, property uh, that's, you know, they've got a very, very uh, substantial tax bill. And we, in terms of the tax burdens, we have received more calls from real estate brokers on the residential side, they're selling, trying to sell a, a home, and the taxes are becoming a real obstacle uh, because they're so high. Well, I want to thank both Chris and, and Jennifer who've done uh, yeoman's work here, and uh, we will be sending out uh, PowerPoints of the presentations. We will be sending out a copy of the recording. We'll be sending out a, a questionnaire as well on what we can do to improve. Um, there's a lot of information, a lot of information that was presented here. I, um, you will have their email addresses so you can reach out to them and connect, um, and connect up with them. They're happy to answer additional questions that are focused just in, on your, um, you know, your case, because everybody has a different tax basis and, you know, different assessment number and real market number and so forth. Uh, you know, the point for us tonight to, to make was that taxes as of the third have increased significantly. Um, and, um, and as you're making your decisions moving forward for 21 and 22, you want to be taking that into consideration uh, as you're doing your both your real estate and your tax planning for your real estate. So uh, I don't believe we have any other questions, right? Is that correct, Abby? You are correct. Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for coming this evening. I know that it was a big chunk of time. The information is difficult to get your mind around. Uh, for me, this has been the third time through, and it's taken me three times to get wrapped around some of the nuance. So uh, don't don't be afraid, embarrassed to ask questions. That 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 summary chart that um, 
that was in the presentation is really super helpful. And again, don't be afraid to ask questions. We really appreciate you coming tonight or this evening. It's now dark now. So uh, have a great evening and uh, we'll see you at our next BNH University in the spring. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye.